Folks, what difference is it going to make? What is your life going to count for? Don't you give me that business that you're just an ordinary person. Don't you tell me you're too old, too young, too poor, too uneducated. You see your calling, brethren. Not many mighty, not many noble are called. Now, God may not use you the way He uses somebody else. You let God decide that. You don't choose your place of service. But you make yourself available to God. And God will use you. Adrian Rogers' ability to apply biblical truth to everyday life was one of the many things that made him such a remarkable pastor, teacher, and writer. Today on Love Worth Finding, he'll be bringing that uniqueness to this series of messages that we're calling Champions of Faith. Have your Bibles open to Hebrews chapter 11 and join us for today's message. And if this message is an encouragement to you, remember, you can stream this message again and download Pastor Rogers' outline, notes, and other resources to go along with this message, all at lwf.org. Now, let's join Adrian Rogers. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. We've been working our way through this wonderful chapter. We're calling it uh, Champions of Faith, and we come now to verse 32. Uh, he has given us one champion after another, and then in verse 32, he says, and what shall I more say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and we spoke of him recently, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, and David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Now we're going to take some of these names in here. Today we're going to be talking about Gideon. One of the things about Gideon that is particularly impressive to me is that he was an ordinary man and God used him mightily. The title of the message is People That God Uses or How to Be Used of God. Would you like God to use you? I mean, would you really? Will it make any difference that you lived? Linus kept after Lucy in the comic strip Peanuts. Linus kept saying to Lucy, tell me a story. Tell me a story. Tell me a story. Finally, in exasperation, Lucy said, a man was born, he lived, he died. She walked away. Linus said, kind of makes you wonder, doesn't it? <laughs> Is that going to be true of you? He was born, he lived, he died. You draw your breath, you draw your salary, you exist to live, you live to exist, and that is all. I heard of a man named Willie who worked for an organization, and Willie died, and somebody came and said, uh, I'd like to apply to fill Willie's place. I want Willie's vacancy. The boss said, Willie didn't leave any vacancy. Now, I'm just wondering if there are a lot of us who will not really leave any vacancy when we go. Will it make any difference that you live? What is your life really ultimately counting for? Who are the kind of people that God uses. Now, let me tell you the situation for our passage of Scripture. And by the way, turn back over, if you would, to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6, and we're going to find here the life of this man, Gideon, that we're talking about today, who is listed as a champion of the faith. Judges chapter 6. And let me give you the background now. There were dark days in Israel. The devil was... Uh, uh, going about as a roaring lion, and the enemies of God were gaining victory upon victory, and the people of God had seemingly thrown in the towel. No longer are they singing on with Christian soldiers. They've hunkered down. They're singing, hold the fort. That's all they were trying to do. Now, I believe that's our generation today. 
Uh, we, we have thought, well, perhaps today we can't have any uh, miracles today. That's what Gideon said. Where are all the miracles that we used to hear of? We have a generation today that really doesn't expect God to do miracles. Poor God. He's not what he used to be. He doesn't have the power today that he used to have. No longer can he save multitudes, shake cities, turn the world upside down. God's kind of old, isn't he? God's kind of sick, isn't he? God's hand is feeble that it cannot move. God's ear is heavy that it cannot hear. God's eyes are dull that he cannot see. No, my friend, God is still God, and we need to understand that there's not one shred of Scripture that says we cannot have a mighty revival in this day and age in which we live. Most of us don't believe that. You talk about revival, all people do is give a sympathetic smile. And they're simply waiting for Jesus Christ to get here. I'm here as your pastor to tell you there has never been a greater day, a greater age to live and to preach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you something else. God wants you, I said you, sir, you, madam, God wants you to be in the middle of it God has a mighty plan for you, and we need to stop moaning and groaning and complaining about living in the last days. Now, in our passage of Scripture, we're going to find something about Gideon. He's kind of hunkered down. Judges 6, verse 11. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak which was in Oprah that pertained unto Joash, the abbot Ezrite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. Now, he's not up on the threshing floor. <laughs> he's down at the wine press. The threshing floor is up on the hilltop so the wind will blow the chap away. The wine press is down there to collect the wine. So he's hiding now from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. That's one thing Gideon would not think of himself as being, folks, a mighty man of valor. As a matter of fact, he is frightened to death. And he says, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all the miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us. Now there are many of us who feel the same way. Oh, how wonderful it was back in the olden times when God was moving mightily. But now God has turned his back on us. God has forsaken us. And, and, and here Gideon's trying to blame it on God. Gideon here is waiting on God. God is waiting on Gideon as we're going to see. The Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might. Underscore that. In this thy might. Now here's a man frightened to death. God calls him a man of valor and speaks of his might. And thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, Oh, my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. God says, Gideon, I've got a job for you to do, and you're a mighty man. He said, Lord, do you know who you're talking to? Lord, of all the families in Israel, all the tribes, my tribe is the least. All the families in that tribe, my family is the poorest. And all of the kids in that family, I am the runt of the litter. You're saying that God is going to use me? God is saying, yes, get in. I'm going to use you. Now, I want you to listen to me. Are you listening? Don't you dare insult God by saying God can't use you. Don't you dare do it. Don't you say, who am I? How can God use me? I'm just an ordinary person. I want to show you today, friend, that God can use you and you, yes, you, ma'am, you, sir, you, team, you can be in God's uh, hall of champions. Now, let me give you five characteristics of people that God uses. Number one, God uses common people. God uses common people. Look again in verse 14. 
And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. Here was a fearful farmer, but God says he is a man of valor. Why is this? God did not see Gideon as he was. God saw him as he could be with God's power upon him. You see, it's not what you are in and of yourself. We might be common as such. Look, look on down to verse 34. The Bible says, but the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Do you see that? The Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. In the Hebrew language, it literally says, the Spirit of the Lord clothed himself with Gideon. How would you like for God to wear you like a suit of clothes? And therefore, it is not necessarily the man, it is God in the man. Uh, God will wear you, friend, like a suit of clothes. God uses ordinary people. Put in your margin, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. Paul in the New Testament is talking to that group of Christians that was going to be used to turn the world upside down. And he said, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, that is, not many PhDs, not many mighty, that is, not many uh, people who are strong physically, not many noble, that means people of high birth, are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world. That word foolish is the word we get our word moron from, to confound the wise. And uh, God hath chosen the weak things of the world. That word means physically weak, anemic, sickly, uh, to confound the things which are mighty. God takes these kind of people. Folks, that's folks like us. What is God saying? It is not scholarship. It is relationship. It is not ability. It is availability. It is not fame. It is faith. God wants ordinary people to do extraordinary things so God himself can get the glory from it. Years ago in New Jersey, there was a man advertised that he was going to play a concert on an extremely valuable violin. People came from all over to hear him play. He tucked that instrument under his chin and began to play. You could hear the laughter of children as he played. You could hear the songs of the birds in the trees as he played. You could hear babies cry as he played. People were amazed at the music that came from that violin. When he had finished the concert, he took that violin and broke it on his knee. They were aghast. Why has he done that? Then he opened his case and brought out the expensive violin. He said, the violin that I've been playing on is a fiddle I bought for a few dollars. And then he said, it is not so much the violin that makes the music as it is the man who draws the bow. Now, you may be just a cheap fiddle, but friend, God is the one, the maestro. God is the one who can make music out of your life and my life. God uses common people. God can use you. Say amen. amen. Now, secondly, God uses cleansed people. Look, if you will, now in chapter 6, verse 25. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, that's a young bull, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal. Baal was a filthy fertility god. They sacrificed the children to Baal. They committed fornication and, and adulterous acts in the name of Baal. They were, it was the god of sexuality. It's the same god that has taken over America today. And throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it. That is, there's an altar here. You take a bull, hook a chain to it, and pull that altar down, and build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of the rock in the ordered place, and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. Now, they worship Baal in groves. So he says, you tear down the altar, uh, take the grove, cut down the trees, build a fire, and offer a blood sacrifice there. Point. If you want God to use you, you've got to take the idols out of your life. If you want God to use you, you have to take the idols out of your life. You say, well, uh, Pastor, this is a modern day. We don't have any idols. Who are you kidding? What is an idol? Something made of stick or stone? Not necessarily. 
Let me tell you what an idol is. An idol th is anything you love more, fear more, serve more, value more than God. That's an idol. Anything you fear more, love more, serve more, value more than God, that is an idol. It doesn't matter what it is. You can make an idol of your job. You can make an idol of your own uh, persona. Now, God says you've got to get the idols out of your life. Now, the problem with uh, Gideon and those around him is their lives were stained with sin. Uh, they had forsaken the Lord their God, and they were serving idol gods. Now, you want God to use you? Listen to me. God will not, he will not, he will not, he will, will not, use you if there's unconfessed, unrepentant of sin in your life. He will not do it. You want to know why God doesn't use me? You ask yourself that question. Is your heart clean? Friend, the Bible says, be clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. I don't even like to wash my feet in a dirty vessel. Now, we've got to be clean if we want God to use us. And uh, God is not going to use us if, friend, there is any idolatry in our lives. Is Jesus Christ number one in your life? If he's not, you have an idol somewhere. Number three, God not only uses common people, and God not only uses cleansed people, but God uses courageous people. Look, if you will, in verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee. Now watch this. Thou mighty man of valor. Valor, we don't use that word much, but it means courage. Courage. Now, not only was God going to uh, use Gideon, but God was going to make Gideon a general. And he said, Gideon, blow the trumpet, gather an army. And he did, and 32,000 people came to help him to deliver Israel from the oppression of the Midianites. Now, begin in Judges chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Now therefore go to, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Now underscore this, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people twenty and two thousand and there remain 10,000. Here they are, 32,000 people. General Gideon says, listen to me. I have an announcement. If there's anybody here who is afraid, we can't use you. Go home. You're excused. 32,000. After the stampede, Gideon gets up and brushes himself off. 10,000 are all that's left. He's lost two-thirds of his army. They've gone home. Today, if you're a coward, God cannot use you. God is looking for mighty men of valor. God is not impressed with the size of this congregation. We can be many and not much. God is looking for brave souls. God is looking for courageous people. God is looking for people that cannot be intimidated. Gideon's army, his number didn't impress God. You say, well, our church is growing, so is the cemetery. God doesn't save by many. He says, if you're afraid, I can't use you. Fear fits you for failure, not for fighting. Besides that, fear is infectious. Deuteronomy, put it in your margin, chapter 20, verse 8. And the officers shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return unto his house lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. God says if there's a war, those who are afraid, just get rid of them. Not only will they not make good soldiers, but they're going to infect others. 
two preachers were talking to one said, do you have any committees in your church? He said, I have all kinds of committees. And they were talking about different kinds of committees. One preacher said, I don't, I bet you don't have a, a cold water committee, a bucket committee. He said, what is that? He said, well, anytime anybody has a good idea, the, the bucket committee comes and pours cold water on it. <laughs> oh, he said, yeah, I've got that committee. I can tell you who the chairman is. <laughs> there are people who think that it can't be done and they're going around telling everybody else why it cannot be done. Now, are you a fearful person? You say, Pastor Rogers, there's some things to be afraid of. I'm not talking about normal fears, like being afraid of a rattlesnake or getting in an, automobile, uh, in an airplane when the weather gets rough and your heart rate goes up. Those are normal fears. That's a, that's a self-protecting uh, instinct that God has put into us. You look both ways when you cross the street. They're like a, like a thunderstorm. That comes and then it's over. But the Bible speaks of a spirit of fear. Have you ever seen people with a spirit of fear? 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. What is the spirit of fear? It's like a fog. It, it just stays and it lingers in the air. It's not like a thunderstorm and then the sun comes back out. God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power and love and of a sound mind. If you're a child of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, God has given you the spirit of power. Jesus said ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. I had rather die than be sentenced to preach without the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. God has given us the spirit of power and of love. Did you know love rem removes fear? The question is not, are you brave enough? The question is, do you love enough? Friend, I tell you what, I'm not by nature courageous. Well, maybe I am a little bit by nature. But if you come after one of my loved ones, you're going to face one of the bravest men you've ever seen. One of the bravest men you've ever seen. If you were to start after my wife or one of my children, Friend, you'd be facing a brave man. Do you know why? Because I love them. Do you love the Lord? God has given us the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. And that word sound mind literally means a mind that cannot be stampeded. It means a, a mind that sees things as they are, not afraid of phantoms, not afraid of spooks, not stampeded by the sinister minister of fear who is the devil. Get filled with the Spirit of God and you're going to have not only an assurance that God can use you, but you're going to find yourself unusually courageous. Now here's the next kind of person that God uses. God uses uh, cautious people. You say, that's contradictory. No, it's not. Look now, if you will, here, chapter 7, verses 4 and 8, at, 4 through 8. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people are yet too many. Bring them down into the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I shall say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people unto the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down on his knees to drink, and the number of them that lapped, uh, putting their hand to their mouth, were 300 men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the 300 men that lapped will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thine hand. And let all the other people go every man to his own place. So the Lord took victuals in their hand. So the people took victuals, that's food, and their trumpets. And he said, all the rest of, the, of Israel, every man unto his tent, and retained those 300 men, and the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley. Now, God says, all right, Gideon, you've sent the fearful home. Now, Gideon, there's another test. Bring the people down here to the brook of Harod and tell them to drink water. It's hot in that valley. I've been in that valley. I've been to this very brook. And he said, all right, men, break ranks and get a drink of water. 
Now, the people began to divide themselves, these 10,000 that were left. There were some men who got down like this, put their mouths in the water, and began to suck up the water. Can you imagine how vulnerable a man would be to the enemy like this with his neck bared? And the Bible says the enemy was right up there. There they are, down with their mouths in the water, sucking up the water. There were 300 men, however, who drank like this, putting their hand to the mouth, looking around. These were cautious men. No, cautious men. You say, I thought we wanted courageous men. Yes, courageous and cautious. I love the balance of the Bible. The Bible says, in nothing be terrified by your adversaries, but the same Bible says, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, goeth about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. How careful we need to be. Uh, we don't just uh, saunter forth and say there's nothing to be afraid of. Friend, we have a wicked, cruel, cunning, malevolent devil, and he's out there to sabotage your life. So the Bible says, watch and pray. Paul said, I keep my body under. I buffet it. I don't give myself to think. You need to watch what you watch. What you see on television. You say, well, it doesn't bother me. I can look at naked women. It doesn't bother me. Is that what you believe, sir? One of three things about you. Either you're no man or you're superman or you're a liar. I believe the third one is true. No, you can't take a fire in your bosom and be not burnt. You watch the company you keep. You watch the places that you go. I heard Billy Graham say on one occasion, I stay frightened. Paul said, I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. There's an enemy and he's real. And you need to stay on guard or God can't use you. Winston Churchill one time said, we must be ready at our weakest possible moment to meet anything the enemy brings against us at his strongest possible moment. Are you on guard? You know what sin often is? Sin is an unexpected opportunity, an unprotected life, and an undetected weakness. You put those together and you go down. The Bible says, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. We must rush on. God uses a cautious people. Friend, God also uses a confident people. A confident people. Look, if you will, now in chapter 7, verses 12 through 15. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along the valley like grasshoppers for multitude, and their camels were without number, as the sand by the sea side for a multitude. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow, and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian, and came unto a tent, and smote it that it fell, and overturned it. And the tent lay along. And his fellow answered and said, this is, nothing sa this is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. For un into his hand hath the Lord delivered Midian and all the host. And it was so that when, when Gideon heard of the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof, that he worshiped and returned unto the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. Now what had happened is this. Now, here is a man. Here's a man who's a common man. Here's a man who is a courageous man. Here's a man who is a cautious man. But now he needs to be a confident man. He needs to understand that God is with him. So the Lord does something for him. He says, um, Gideon, 
I want you to get a, a buddy, and I want you to go into the camp of the enemy, and I want you to reconnoiter. I want you to go down there into the camp. I want you to see what is happening. And so here goes Gideon, and he somehow sl slips past the guards, and he gets right into the middle of the camp of the Midianites. And he comes up to a tent, and he hears two people in the tent talking. And Gideon is eavesdropping. One man said to the other man, I had a terrible dream last night. He said, what was it? He said, there was a, a, a loaf of barley bread, a barley roll of bread, and it came tumbling down the hill. And he said, it hit a tent. And when it did, it knocked the whole tent down. The whole thing collapsed. Just a, a roll of barley bread. The other man said, you know what that was? You know what you saw? That roll of barley bread, that was Gideon. That was Gideon. Gideon heard all of this. And the man said, that we've lost. Why, 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 that's, that's just Gideon. We've lost. Now think about it. Barley bread. Friend, barley bread was the poorest bread you could get. <laughs> It wasn't, it wasn't a whole wheat. It wasn't vitamin enriched. That was poor man's bread. And it, it comes tumbling down and destroys the whole thing. When Gideon heard that, he went back and said, fellas, we've won. We have won. Listen, let me tell you something. There is a dread in hell over you. You say, me? I'm just barley bread. That's the point. The devil hopes that you never really understand who you are or what you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, I'm just a piece of barley bread. That's right. Listen to me. I have seen people too big in their own sight for God to use. I've never seen a man small in his own sight that God could not use. God wants to take ordinary people and do extraordinary things through ordinary people. Now, you make certain that your heart is clean, you fill the Spirit. A tiger met a lion as they sat beside the pool, said the tiger to the lion, why are you roaring like a fool? <laughs> That's not foolish, said the lion with a twinkle in his eyes. They call me the king of all beasts because I advertise. A rabbit heard them talking. Ran home like a streak. He thought he'd try the lion's plan, but his roar was just a squeak. A fox came to investigate, had his lunch in the woods. And so, my friend, when you advertise, be sure you've got the goods. <laughs> now, listen. Listen, you do have the goods if your heart is clean. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you may be only a piece of barley bread but God is going to use you, there is a dread in hell that one of these days God's people are going to wake up as to who they are and what we have in the Lord Jesus. Those people in that tent were already afraid. That's the devil's crowd. They knew Gideon. Gideon was known in hell. Are you known in hell? I want my name to be on the bulletin board in hell. I want it to be in hell's post office. There he is, Adrian Rogers. He's dangerous. He's just barley bread, but he's dangerous. Friend, you can't have your name posted in heaven's hall of champions unless you have it posted in hell's post office of enemies. Gideon was known in hell. There was a man who tried to cast some demons out in the book of Acts. Well, actually, seven of them, seven sons of Sceva, Sceva and sons, going out there at exorcist to cast demons out. And they came against a man who was filled with demons. And the man in whom the demons were turned on this man, uh, on these men, stripped their clothes from them, beat them up. They ran like whipped puppies, naked, fleeing. What had happened is this. They said to this demon-possessed man, we adjure you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, come out of him. 
That's secondhand religion. They didn't say in the name of Jesus whom I know, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. That's secondhand religion. You can't say in the name of Jesus that Adrian preaches. You have to say in the name of Jesus whom I know. You know what the demon said? <laughs> this is really funny. The demon said to these seven, huh, yeah, Jesus I know and Paul I know. Who are you? Who are you? And they're running because their name was not known in hell. Your name needs to be known in hell. The demons need to know that you're somebody. An ordinary person, barley bread, common, courageous, cautious, confident that God can use you. God gave victory that day. Would you like to live in victory? Or you just want it written of you? There was a man born, he lived, he died. Folks, what difference is it going to make? What is your life going to count for? Don't you give me that business that you're just an ordinary person. Don't you tell me you're too old, too young, too poor, too uneducated. You see your calling, brethren. Not many mighty, not many noble are called. Now, God may not use you the way he uses somebody else. You let God decide that. You don't choose your place of service. But you make yourself available to God. And God will use you. I believe that. Do you believe it? Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will help us, Lord, as a church, as individuals, Lord, to be surrendered to you, Lord, usable in the battle. And Father, to bring glory to Jesus. Now, while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I've been speaking today to God's children. I've been speaking today to those who are saved, not to the unsaved, but to the saved. Now, before you can be used of God in any of these other ways I've mentioned, first of all, you've got to know Jesus as your personal Savior and Lord. Let me tell you this, that we're sinners, sinners by birth, by nature, by choice, and by practice. Our sin deserves judgment. But God wants to save us, and God will save us, anybody who will trust him. The Bible says it clearly and plainly. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. What do you believe about Jesus? That he died for your sins? That he shed his blood for you? That he was raised from the dead? That he is willing and able to save you and will save you? Would you pray a prayer like this? Oh, God, I am a sinner. I am lost. I can't save myself. But now today, with all of my heart, like a little child, I trust you to save me. Come into my life. Forgive my sin. Cleanse me and save me. And thank you for doing it. And help me never to be ashamed of you. Take all there is of me and use me for your glory. Amen. Well, amen. God has been moving in these services, and I'm so grateful that you've been watching. You notice that I asked those present, to give their hearts to Jesus Christ. And I thank God for those who responded, but many of you who watched through this ministry also responded. And you said along with these in this building, I receive Christ into my heart. I thank God that you did. Now, if you did, would you please write to us and let us know, number one, we will rejoice. Number two, we will sincerely pray for you. Number three, we will send you free of charge some materials to help you to get started in your Christian life. It is so important that you learn how to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So write to us and ask for the New Believers materials and we'll send them right out to you. God bless you. We hope that you've been encouraged by these character studies from Hebrews chapter 11 that we're calling Champions of Faith. You can stream this message again, share this message with a friend, and download other resources related to this message all at lwf.org or the My LWF app. While you're there, be sure to check out our new Bible studies on today's topic, as well as many other topics. At lwf.org, you can also subscribe to our daily heartbeat emails. Each heartbeat contains a daily devotional from Adrian Rogers, 90 seconds of profound truth, 
also from Adrian Rogers, as well as a link to our daily radio program, all in one place, delivered directly to your computer or mobile device each day. Or you can catch up with our program each week on our Facebook page or YouTube channel and on the My LWF app. Thanks for joining us for today's message. We'll see you next time. Light has absolute power over darkness. The darkness cannot put out the light. The light can put out the darkness. Light is more powerful than darkness, and truth is more powerful than error. The times are growing dark, but as Adrian Rogers says, they are gloriously dark because the light of Christ shines brighter in the darkness. In his book, Standing for Light and Truth, pastor, teacher, and author Adrian Rogers offers insights and guidance to help you live with godly integrity and to shine his light in a world growing dark. For your gift this month, we'd love to send you Standing for Light and Truth. Request yours when you give at 1-800-647-9400 or you can give online at lwf.org. Stand boldly for truth in these dark days of deceit. Call or go online today.